something that you welcome people to. Revolutions are messy and violent, and, and we, as you can imagine. But this revolution or, are, or these revolutions are in science and technology paradigms. And you need not me to tell you how science and technology really touched our lives, actually revolutionized our lives. And uh, anything you look at or even don't see is affected by science and technology. Even the door that opens by itself, imagine. But this is science and technology. And this is part of the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Technology and Science Symposium, as you see in this program. And uh, to those of uh, our viewers who don't know where Charleston, Illinois, it is in Illinois, and Illinois is in America. And there is a city called Charleston, believe me. And uh, uh, today we have a special presentation on technology and ethics. And uh, I will take an hour to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lisa Brooks, but uh, she is very kind enough to talk uh, about this her experience. Says about science. Okay, well, thank you, Afik, and thank you uh, to the audience for being here today. So my background, I'm uh, hospitality-driven, and so that makes me very kind as an individual, which uh, ethics and etiquette and hospitality together, you get a very civilized world. And so today I was just delighted to speak on technology and etiquette. To be honest, I really like people more than I like technology, and so um, I'm going to share with you uh, the, the with of what's in it for me after you're finished with this presentation. I think you're going to have some practical tools uh, as they relate to technology and etiquette as well as I wanted to share some differences. We're seeing the research is showing uh, technology use by generation is, is very different uh, these days. So, so you can see where you fit in by generation. And then multitasking. Uh, there is a lot of information on this concept. Is multitasking an art or a myth? And then at the very end, we're going to go through some uh, technological tact uh, types of, of uh, practices. So I'll show you how to use technology tactfully that will improve your self-image. And so uh, what I propose today is that if you apply what you learn uh, from this session, you're going to be safer. I believe that uh, multitasking can kill you, and I'll explain what the research says in just a moment. And then I also propose that you're going to be smarter. After this presentation, you're going to be able to uh, perform at a higher level, and I think you're going to be, probably the students, you're going to get better grades on your term papers and or exams. And then, you know, if you think about it, how smart is it to study for an exam while listening to music or watching TV while texting? Uh, students of today's culture often do at least four uh, tasks at a time. Does that fit? Does that sound like the students in the room a little bit, maybe three? And then lastly, your image. You're always being judged, and whether you like it or not. So what is your image saying about you? And so if you apply what you learned today, I think you're going to be uh, perceived as being very courteous and refined and sophisticated. So maybe that will eventually lead to, to good things happening in your life. And so but let's look at, this is a research done by Larry Rosen. And this kept coming up. I kept, you, I kept seeing two uh, new terms, net generation and I generation. And I'm not going to tell you what generation I fall into, other than to tell you that I really like telephone calls. And I really like email. So my students know that. I like the face-to-face -face, uh, communication. But yet, I think a lot of my students know they're falling into the net generation or the I generation. And it explains why sometimes they want me to text them as opposed to um, emailing them. Or, you know, it's interesting. I've been teaching now for 15 years or 16. And my office hours are dead. Nobody comes to visit me face to face. My students are uh, emailing me their questions, which is kind of an interesting perspective. So again, this uh, research just illustrates we really have evolved and our, our younger generations are using technology, particularly social media, more than ever before. Uh, my my uh, friend was telling me that her son sleeps with a phone next to his bed. So he'll get the next text all through the night, and I'm just thinking, oh my heavens. So we're going to look at that, the consequences of that type of behavior in just a moment. And so this is this uh, concept. It's, is multitasking a myth? And uh, it is definitely not an art. And so if we look at the definition of multitasking, it's doing at least two activities simultaneously. And so this is uh, more research. Uh, I particularly like Stanford uh, University and the research that came from uh, Clifford Nass. 
He's the author of The Man Who Lied to His Laptop. And interestingly enough, top, the top 25% of students at Stanford were using at least four technologies uh, simultaneously. And then if you look at the tweens, about 25%, the top 25% of tweens are using three technologies simultaneously. And so what I loved was this notion that multitaskers are a mental wreck. The danger is they don't think they are. So if you think about that, uh, we're gonna look at what multitasking does to cognitive functioning. And when we look at the, the research again, this notion that actually multitasking can harm your academic or work performance. And Mr. Henderson can maybe talk to this a little bit uh, if he has any questions afterwards, but chronic multitasking deteriorates our cognitive performance. We actually are doing four or five things at once, but we're not comprehending any of what we're doing. So again, those exam scores, if you think back, you know, perhaps you wanted to get an A, but you got a B, think about how did you study for that exam? How many different tasks were you doing? Uh, memory tasks are far lower when we're multitasking. So again, it's put into our short-term memory, but over time we've forgotten everything that we learned, which I don't want to happen today, because I see that everybody is 100% laser focused. And then we see uh, our creativity is compromised. Again, our brain gets tired. We're constantly getting a lot of external stimuli, and so our brain just gets fatigued, and we're not able to be as uh, creative, so we don't have that recharge time for our brains to, to get excited about uh, new and creative ideas. And then over time, we lose our ability to focus. And so um, we'll talk about that as well, as well in just a moment. And then I like to illustrate this notion that uh, multitasking can be potentially life-threatening, particularly to drivers and pilots. And one of my students in class the other day uh, wore a helmet to class and in class and it prompted a conversation. And I asked her, you know, why are you wearing a helmet? Oh, well, do you know how many of my friends on campus have gotten hurt and sent to the emergency room because they were bicycling and either a car crashed into them or they crashed into something else. And so after that, I got to laughing about it. I walked around campus and lo and behold, what were they wearing? These hoodie sweat, or these uh, students were bicycling with these hoodies with the iPods where one was actually texting, not looking where he was going. It almost ran straight into, straight into this car. When I looked at what the driver was doing, the driver was talking to his buddy and it looked like he was fiddling with the radio. And I thought, my goodness, no wonder emergency room visits are up. So this is a true point about this idea that multitasking is unsafe and particularly, uh, or potentially life-threatening. And so why do we multitask? Because we think we can. And to me, this is more case um, point about this notion that our brains are cognitively deteriorating. If you think you can multitask, you're de in denial because your brain really can't. We can't really do more than two things at once. Or we're better off with what's called monotasking. Focusing on one task at a time if you want to improve brain function. And then we also are doing it because there's a lot of entertainment value in multitasking. Lots of bells and whistles, lots of external uh, stimuli, and over time it becomes habit forming as well as addictive. So it's interesting because when they ask uh, certain population groups to say, you know what, just study in silence, they go crazy. They can't do it. And so it's harder for them to go study in silence now because they're so accustomed to having the external stimuli. And then lastly, it's this notion about social degradation. You know, I'm very concerned about our population and what's going to happen if we all continue to, to multitask. It's this, co I think in American culture in particular, we're, we're so used to being individuals and sometimes a little bit self-absorbed that we forget to look at the world around us. And so, you know, again, multitasking kind of harms society in a way because we're not really paying attention to people, we're paying attention to technology. And so if, I'll show you a quick little video segment. It's only three minutes in length, but it illustrates this idea of what multitasking is. Mindspark Life Without Limits, and welcome to this week's edition of Yes, Domination Monday. Today, I want to talk about the risks of multitasking. People who really multitask, or are they being less productive? Are you being more productive or less productive? People who multitask 
feel like they are accomplishing more, but are they actually cutting down their own productivity? Studies show that only 2% of people can effectively multitask while whopping 98% are doing more harm to themselves than good. You got 10 people in a room, nine out of 10 people are not multitasking well. Technology is encouraging more and more unproductive multitasking in many ways. Smartphones make it hard not to multitask while watching TV, while driving, right? I mean, how many people when they first get their license go out there and barely know how to turn the car on, right? You're worried about shifting, blinkers, you got windshield washer fluid, you're checking yourself. Now, I mean, how many people are literally writing an email on their phone, doing their makeup, and eating a Big Mac while they're out driving, right? And trying to shift gears. Trying to accomplish more than one thing causes a 40% drop in productivity. Even though you may feel like you're accomplishing more, the opposite is happening. If you don't pay appropriate attention to what has your attention, it will take more of your attention than it deserves. David Allen, author of Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity. Do you know the average phone call interrupts somebody for more than 15 minutes? So in one hour, if you're dedicating yourself to writing a paper and you take two phone calls during that time, they may be three or four minutes long for a conversation, but it interrupts your mind and your pattern of thinking of getting to where you are. 15 minutes, that's a half an hour. You're supposed to write something for an hour, then in an hour you have an appointment, right? You get a phone call, then you get another appointment, then you only have 38 minutes and you say, ah, screw it, I'm not gonna have enough time to get into it. So you never even accomplish the main thing that you were supposed to do. Multitasking confuses your brain and actually slows down productivity. Concentrating on one task will get the job done faster and much more efficiently. Let's concentrate on one task at hand just for one week and see how much more productive you can be, how much more focused you can be, and how much more purposeful you can be every single day while you're working. I'm Adam Bergen, author of MindSpark, Life Without Limits. Have a fantastic week. So hopefully you'll try that. Just try to monotask for one week and tell me what the results are. I'll be interested to hear. And so now we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the etiquette side of uh, technology and what is happening in society. Well, I think every generation says this. They always say, ah, oh, you know, this uh, people today are just getting more and more rude. And it's it's no different. Technology is, is cited as one of the culprits for the rudeness in, in our uh, culture. Uh, you know, rudeness is defined as a discourteous behavior or lacking refinement or delicacy, which again, if you're not rude, you have an opportunity to shine in this particular day and age. 70% uh, of adults said Americans are more rude than 20 or 30 years ago because we're more stressed out, which I think most of us can agree, and technology again contributes to our level of stress if we're always plugged in. Uh, even if we watch television show, shows anymore, there's a lot of uh, negativity with uh, role modeling, and that again contributes to this idea that, that life is horrible and, and uh, we can just uh, get stressed out by watching a television program. And then this is where we are with all these different types of, of technological devices. It really affects our ability to, to be a good human being sometimes when we stop paying attention to each other. And so, you know, again, my background is in etiquette, and I started looking at what happens if you practice etiquette? What are the rewards? And all sorts of great things happen. Your relationships improve, and that's so critical because when you have good relationships, that's one of the number one factors. More important than money, your relationships will determine your level of happiness in this lifetime. So work on your relationships. It's more important than money that you will have in this lifetime. Second, people like you more. Uh, if you're courteous, don't you agree? People like people who are pretty considerate. It's not hard to do, uh, but it's important. And because you know the world starts looking pretty good when people are nice to you, people are saying hello to you, your self-confidence starts improving because you realize it's a pretty friendly place. And you're, you're not afraid to take risks, which hopefully will make you more successful and self-confident. Um, you know, I, I'm the internship coordinator for the School of Family and Consumer Sciences, and I'm always wondering how can we make our students become more employable? And this is one of the biggest areas, etiquette and professionalism. Are they courteous in the workplace? And you know that will determine whether they want to hire you after your internship, as well as retain you over time, and hopefully promote you uh, to, to some high power positions uh, during the lifetime of your career. And then over time, you're gonna realize that you're not as stressed out. 
If you start paying attention to people as opposed to technology, your stress levels start to lower. That's what we were designed to do, but people, people mostly, not people, and we're trying this interfacing with technology that really does contribute to our stress levels, and then this is that concept. You can really help the world by just being courteous. And so these are the last uh, points that I would like you to think about. And so this one, uh, getting real, a real person always takes precedent over a device that deserves your full attention. This is such a great concept. I think it will help your dating life. It will help your uh, employability. It will help all sorts of areas. But don't you agree, how important is it to, when someone walks into the room, to give them eye contact, give them their, your full attention, let them know you matter more than what's on this screen. And then be aware of your surroundings. This is interesting. Uh, you can uh, become aware of this. How many times have you been in the, the restrooms in Eastern Illinois University and you find somebody next to you using their cell phone in the bathroom stall and you cannot get away? You have to listen to that conversation. And that's a rule to keep in mind. If you're on an elevator, if you're in a bathroom, if people can't literally leave the space, that's probably an inappropriate use of technology. And I, I, I need not remind you that uh, cell phones are one of the most uh, dirty technological devices that we have. Never put a cell phone on a table during dinner uh, for perhaps that reason of the bathroom stalls. Uh, but meetings also. People have overused uh, their cell phones during meetings and it's just inappropriate, unprofessional behavior. And then other good rules, uh, being transparent, don't hide behind the uh, anonymity of social media, because again, you know, we, we have a tendency to be a little bit more brave, and this brings out the haters in our society sometimes, and so if you're not anonymous, if people know who you are, you're probably gonna be less likely to be rude or hurtful to someone else. And so, you know, it's important that we're transparent when we're using any kind of technology. And avoiding email distractions, I started practicing this. I know in the workplace particularly, I will get a little prompt up, got another email, got another email. And the average professional gets 100,000 emails in one year, 100,000 emails. And so this is a wonderful little tip and a tool Delegate, say I'm gonna block off 20 minutes and I'm gonna answer all emails in that 20 minutes and then I'm gonna focus on a different task, but I'm not gonna keep bouncing back between answering an email and going back to my task. This will improve your productivity tenfold. So try this. Uh, and also, monotasking, I've talked about this, but again, try to monotask for one week and see if you can do it and if it doesn't indeed improve your productivity. And then this concept of using technology. You know, you use it, don't let it use you because again, it will change the way you live your life. And you know, I'm a registered dietitian among other things and uh, it's really important during mealtime, I think, to have a technology-free zone. Put all of the cell phones in a basket in the center of the table. Everybody will have to communicate and talk with each other. No television, no music, unless you really think that's important. But it's important to hear the sound of the human voice and have eye contact over meals. That will, again, improve your relationships. And so you'll know what generation I'm from because I wanted you to, to practice another tip about just enjoying silence. And after I did this presentation, I, I spent a week without listening to any music. I spent, I didn't, uh, I unplugged from my technology, and my goodness, I think it cleansed my brain. I felt quite liberated. So just to kind of think about uh, enjoying the si sound of silence, I'm gonna leave you with uh, a classic from Simon and Garfunkel on the sound of silence. And then after this plays for a couple of minutes, we'll go to questions. that song long enough it'll be in your junk memory but hopefully it'll be enough I played enough of it where you're here thinking about the sound of silence as you leave this session so 
Um, as a summary, just to remind you, there are definite benefits to applying etiquette and technology. You're going to be safer, smarter, and more considerate and refined. And uh, the I generation, it was born after 1990, are considered the biggest multitaskers. Don't forget that multitasking can kill you or someone else, so be careful. And lastly, if you uh, use technology tactfully, I think that you will always have some really great relationships and make sure that you put real people always over devices. So life is good, be happy, be kind, thank you. And so do you have questions? Thank you very much. Well, I have I, I have ten questions, but I will start with you if you have any questions. I'll start with mine. Uh, do we need to redefine multitasking? Meaning, uh, what you said is multitasking the real multi, uh, not real multitasking. But I can go to my home and push the microwave oven for 15 minutes to do this, and then put the uh, thing on the oven to start for another. So I can start three or four things in one minute. Yes. Not at the same time, but they are multitasking. This is a true multitasking, different than putting the cell phone here and this here and that here. Well, I think if you're pushing the microwave button while you're texting, while you're eating. No, no, I, I meant just push this button and leave it. Concentrate on the oven and concentrate on this. But the, the, the thing with multitasking, you're doing it all at once. You've got lots yes, of external okay. stimuli so coming in simultaneously. Simultaneously. So, so again, you know, it's that notion that if you're writing a term paper, that's the only task you need to be doing, as opposed to having all of the other stimuli coming in yes. while you're you're. Uh, writing that paper because you're losing your sharp focus and I believe don't you does anybody agree with that that concept that, that our, our cognitive functioning is starting to deteriorate over time as we continue to multitask? Well, it's deteriorated over 40 years because I've <laughs> always been in technology. Yeah, but it's a very but stressful, yes, yeah, I, d I would not, I, I would I would struggle uh, being in any, involved in a career that involves so much uh, use of technology. So. so, again, to define multitasking, is what I said as example now of starting three or four or five activities differently. I mean, I concentrate on this, and because I can put my finger in this only, and then, and then, and then, while they are going together, is this multitasking or not? It, it, it is, but I want to bring you to another concept. Because yes. I think that, you know, there are a lot of wellness seminars that are focusing on being in the moment and being in the now. And it all goes back to not focusing on what multitasking is, is can you monotask? Can you concentrate on one task at one time where you're in the moment? And if you can concentrate on being present, which is a little zen, your stress level is is much lower and so you know i i know uh, dr andrew Weil talks a lot about this he's the medical doctor eight uh weeks to optimal health he's written a lot of books on on wellness and he'll focus on if he's washing dishes the only thing that he is focusing on is the washing of a plate and then when he's ready to cook a meal he goes to the task at hand and he only focuses on what's in the skillet and focuses that way as opposed to when you start shifting gears and you're preoccupied to okay I've got this task going and this task going and this task going I think it's very difficult for the brain to be able to function at an optimal or capacity we can do it we just don't do it well and I think, like I said, over time, we're going to probably see that, that it's taken a toll on our well-being and our, our uh, livelihood Very and good. our relationships. Uh, you know, my, my fiance really struggles with this, but I, I insist on full attention. He's a, he has to look me in the eye when he speaks, and you know that's not always easy for most people. He's wanting to watch, like I think last night, the game. Uh, who won the Red Sox? I don't know. Whatever big game. Uh, was playing last night, and I was ready for a conversation. So you've got to kind of pick your timing, but full attention may, means a big, makes a big difference in your relationships. So. Very good. Other questions? And you know, that's what I, I challenge with um, some of the multitasking because I too believe that that classical music can heal and kind of facilitate that process. 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that research that looks at what types of uh, multitask or other areas like external stimuli can actually improve cognitive functioning. And they say that sometimes with uh, driving as well. If you turn on music and you're afraid of highway hypnosis, that will improve your cognitive functioning. So again, I think that, that the research definitely shows that classical music in particular, uh, if you read the Mozart effect, uh, it will enhance your cognitive functioning. So listen to classical music. Uh, if you can while doing your function and just see how, how it affects your performance individually uh, because I think we're all very different. I know that some teenagers, if you play classical music, well, they, they would probably be pulling their hair, hair out. They would not have a, a, a good experience with classical music and uh, try to try to turn paper. <laughs> so. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, Cyberbullying has become pretty much mainstream in the news, um, how would how do you would you advise teaching or training a teenager or someone that's social media? Yeah. You know, how 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 do you protect kids or how should they react to their friends? And again, it, it, it's because it's a hard age and cyberbullying is prevalent, but a lot of it is because they're transparent. They're going by they don't use real names, real faces, and you know, I, I think that, that one of the rules of thumb that I've seen is, would you say this to them in person? And, you know, how would you feel? And it's the, the sensitivity cues, because we lose our humanity when we're on the computer, and that's so unfortunate. And so I think with, with younger, the younger generation, you have to have those conversations with them. You know, would you say this to them in person? How would you feel if they said that to you? Do you realize how that might harm or heal? And there are a lot of school programs now that I think have very structured ways of dealing with cyberbullying. But, you know, it's the transparency effect. We say things that are perhaps coming across as much more negative. We don't think we'll have consequences or if we don't know who's saying them, it makes us a little bit braver. And uh, it's unfortunate because the internet is a permanent record and we certainly see the consequences of cyberbullying and how it's, it's a tool for harm, but it doesn't have to be that way because there are lots of benefits from, from socializing online if it's used appropriately. But I think we just forget those other people are human beings and it's just too easy to see them as, as maybe uh, an extension of a technological device. Any other questions? Well, and, and, and another thing, with the I generation being so technologically savvy with the texting and the social media and all that, could that bleed over into a face-to-face? -face? I mean, the way they carry themselves oh, yeah. or represent themselves this is, that way. I, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, they don't make eye contact quite as much. The, the I generation, if you look, they, they will look down. They feel very uncomfortable often. Would you agree that if you're not used to talking with people, it can be quite intimidating. You know, you would rather text, and I see this in the classroom all the time. Students are sitting two feet from each other, and they text each other as opposed to just turning their head and asking somebody else a question. And when you lose those social cues and clues, it affects your interpersonal skills. You don't listen quite as well. You, you perhaps uh, don't read body language quite as well. You don't come across as self-confident when you're looking down, but if that's what you've become accustomed to through texting. So it definitely is a skill set that, that we're losing that seems to be contributing to, uh, it's interpreted as rudeness, but really it's just, that's a habit for them because they're so used to it. It's a lifestyle, which is why I'm so glad you're all here today because you know it's through education that we start going from one extreme back to moderation and I believe everything has to there's a, a moderate level a little bit of texting but a little bit of eye contact too to improve those interpersonal skills so. any other questions just quick question regarding multitasking has any research uh, uh, connected the multitasking to greed to greed and pride I don't know I haven't seen any but I suspect you know because in one sense technology is the root of all evil <laughs> in one sense multitasking looks like a buffet eat as you can so you find yeah. lots of things and you want to take everything but this is where you know your concept ethics it's all about moderation 
you know, that's the golden rule of life. And so when you get into extremes, extreme use of technology, I think, could lead to uh, some uh, character uh, flawed behavior, greed being one of them. And so, you know, moderation, keep it in perspective, and you can use you can use it to your advantage, but it won't be using you and change who you are as a human being. Very good. Thank you very much, and we'll thank have you. to bring this uh, close. Well, thank Please. you, guys. I'm glad you were here. And thank, thank you for thank bringing you. a human <laughs> element to the technology. Yeah. Go do something nice for someone today. See if that lowers your stress. Thank you. Thank you.